Welcome to School Matters. I'm Sean Gilliland. On this week's show, we've got student tech gurus, volunteer fairs, and STEAM nights. First up, we'll take a look at a program at Tucker High School that helps provide skills to students in preparation for life after high school. We're doing such a great job, Will. We were so excited to implement the PERT program this summer. For years, we've had students go to Wilson Workforce Center for the PERT program that lasts for 10 days in the summertime where they're able to explore all kinds of vocational skills and independent living skills. This is normal and casual. This is delicate. These are hand washers. We're here to assess students on life skills um, in their own community. These are students who may not be ready to go away from home for 10 days for the PERT program that we have at Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center. So we're bringing the program to them. Okay. I'm going to tell you, Mom, you need to do laundry. You're pretty good at this. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. We've assessed them on things like cooking, kitchen safety, laundry, money management, those life skills that you need to be as independent as possible in the community. We're a transition program that works with students that helps transition them from the high school environment to the world of work. That's our goal and that's what we're working with our students here on. Okay, ready? What's wrong? Yeah, now we got it. Okay, so now this has been really exciting for me to get to spend time with them in their natural environment and get to see them interact with each other and to really get to see their skills shine. This will help them by identifying their strengths and areas that they need development in and improvement in so we know where they are and where they need to build up to be independent and have these skills. It was really a remarkable time to have the students here. We were able to do some financial literacy assessments. We were able to do some independent living assessments. And then they actually went out in the community and did some work-based learning there. Right now, one of the things that we're gonna be doing is preparing the table when the customer leaves. So when the customer leaves, we got our waitresses ready. He went to Zorba's and he worked there for two hours. I watched him bust tables, wipe things, place the you know the plates back on the table with the napkins, and go back and forth and follow the um, gentleman from Zorba's. And it was nice to see how everybody there, you know, just brought him into the fold and was eager to show him what to do. One right here, and one over here. Ha! Perfect. Let's go over there. Excellent, excellent. Great. And now we leave it in here. Tyler takes pride, and he he's, gets really excited when he can do something on his own. And if he can look at you and say, I do it. And then he goes and he does it. There you go. Awesome. Let's go and put it where we take that one out. My goal is to help these kids have as smooth a transition as possible from Henrico County Public Schools to work afterwards or life after, or after high school, whatever that would look like for these kids. So the better I know them, the better I know what their work skills are, and the better that they know their work skills and can really trust their own abilities, the better opportunities they'll have after school. And I think the DARS program helps him find out where he falls in the workforce. You know, where in this pendulum does he fit? And DARS is going to help him find his placement. And I think that's awesome. Great job. Tyler was all smiles, and that's what I like. When he's happy, he feels accomplished. 
To be able to do it here in our community where families already know the businesses, they already know the staff that's going to be working with their child, I think it really makes a difference in making it a more cohesive experience. Special thanks go out to the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services for helping to provide work-based learning experiences for our students. And that's just one more way our students are gaining life-ready skills throughout the county. At Fairfield Middle School, there was a STEAM fair for 8th grade students, and the Falcons got to check out possible career options that are available to them throughout their educational journey. Let's take a look. I decided to do a STEAM fair for our eighth grader. So students were, had the opportunity to see the different options that they had available to them in the high school, college, and career sector. In the gym, we had the career section, so we had Cold Virginia, we had Capital One. You know, Capital One is a very huge organization here in the Richmond area, and they brought um, four other people that worked in different departments um, there at, for the event. Some of the combinations, it's like simple code. We had the Science Museum, so the Science Museum was able to come, and students were able to see, you know, if you decided to, you know, go down this career path, what, what, like, what kind of opportunities do you have? How you doing, guys? BCU Athletics brought their um, heart rate monitor system with them and the students had to jog in place and they had to beat one of the athletes that, that came with BCU Athletics. Go. When they had the opportunity to you know, race against a, you know, a college student, they took the opportunity and really had a great time with it. A lot of students kept saying, Mr. Brooks, I want to do it, I want to do it. So like I said, I'm all about planting that seed and that was awesome for them to be able to see that. Uh, that's it. I think you want that. Maybe college may not be the best option, but they're able to know that if they go to like the ACE Center at you know Holland Springs or Hermitage, that they can get a certification and get a trade, and they'd be able to work right out of high school. Yeah, starting out, we're coming in the door. That's what you're doing. So this is the this is the job. My biggest hope and wish the students are able to just get excited about their future and if they decided to go down a STEAM field, they know what options that they have available to them in the Richmond area. When I was your age, I went to Fairfield. Your junior and senior year, we have internships, so our internship is already matching potential. Challenging student athletes from the VCU soccer team was definitely the highlight of the event for the 8th grade Falcons. Stay with us because after the break, we've got more ways HTPS is preparing our students for the future. Looks like it's done. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. Can you identify this state? Well, if you said Arizona, you'd be correct. Arizona is the 48th state, having joined the U.S. in 1912. For the hot summers, population growth was slow. But the invention of air conditioning helped increase the area's popularity, especially with senior citizens in search of mild winters. Although known for its desert climate, half of the state features mountains and forests. The capital city is Phoenix, and the biggest attraction is the Grand Canyon. Arizona, a lot of beach, just no ocean. This, all right, so this is called a turbo. So the way it works is, you see this little hole? The air will come through here. And then it will in turn spin this, like a windmill. 
That was the Career Cafe at Three Chopped Elementary, giving kindergarten through fifth grade students the chance to explore different fields of work with parents, community partners, and the ACE Center at Hermitage. Future career options are a big part of the show this week. Now I'm sure you've heard of the Cuyacasin Middle School Griffins, but have you heard of the Griffin Gurus? They're a group of students who love technology so much, they want to share it with everyone in the school. What I'm going to do is have our two gurus here pass out an iPad to each group. So. All of this technology equipment that we have this year uh, is new, and so we knew we needed to introduce it to the teachers in some way. And so we wanted the kids to be able to do it because we knew that the teachers would be more open to using the technology if they could see how the kids reacted to it and responded to it. And so we waited until we had an empty faculty meeting and then had the kids start working on how they wanted to do it. A number of session options for you teachers to choose from. So at each session, there will be a group of Griffin gurus, and each session will take place in a classroom. We want to teach you guys how to use it and we want to teach the students how to use it. And the, all of the Griffin Gurus got to make a slideshow or a presentation on a technology that we've been working on in class and we got to sign up the teachers to do whatever two technologies they wanted to do. Just do it by yourself. I'm going to hand out help sheets. Carter is going to pass out some iPads. And the teachers kind of got to experience what we did when we were getting to know these technologies and that was just learning through play, just giving a quick introduction and then they were just on their own and we were there just for help. Enemies, that's a power up. Oh, there. Oh. There you go. go through this. Close it out. My friend and I, we did green screen and so we just talked about the basics of it and then we allowed them to explore and play with the technology. How did you make it? I don't know what you're doing. Yes, yes, you did. Well, you did. We had block souls where the teachers were learning how to incorporate video game design in their classroom. There was the Makey Makeys. They had how to improve student presentations, different apps on the iPad, video filming and green screen. So really the sky was the limit there. They were joking doing what the classic bad students would do. They were like, is it time for me to get out my phone and start playing games? They were actually really good students. Um, I did have one of my teachers in one of my sessions and she was like, I really wanted to act like a student and be like, can I go to the bathroom? Can I get water? I need a pencil. Six points. The whole point of it was to, to be student led and for students to take the autonomy to learn these different things and to get in the classrooms and to pro provide professional developments to the teachers. They are experts on the technology that we have in this building um, and they're self-chosen experts because they applied to be in this course. I love just playing with uh, any technologies and I really liked picking this fifth block over any other study hall. If these students are teaching at middle school, who knows what the gurus will be doing by the time they get to high school. Speaking of high school, over at the ACE Center at Hermitage, students in the automotive class got to share what they learned and that made for a very happy family. We adopted Miss Carter's family for the Christmas mother and in asking her what she needed for the holidays, she mentioned stuff that she needed for her sons. But we went a little further and asked her what she needed and uh, that's when the dis discussion started about uh, needing repairs to her car, and so thought of uh, contacting Mac Beaton, see what he could do, how he could help us out. You know, it, we looked at it honestly as an easy opportunity for our students because one of the things they learn is inspecting cars. So this was a chance to see what failed and what to do to fix it. When we got the car in, it was in very bad shape. It not only 
where the things that were it was rejected for, we found a lot more that was wrong with it to the point that the car was beyond repair. Uh, so with the kindness of some others, we were able to find another car to replace it. And today we have the car in and we're going through that car, change it all, making sure everything on that car is perfect. They've been given the opportunity yeah, to learn a skill, and it's a skill that a lot of people do not have. And so if you have something, have the opportunity to share that with others, it makes you feel good. And that's really what this gave the students, the opportunity to take the skill sets they've learned and give back. It's a great feeling to know we helped somebody out, and just there's a great resource with the uh, Henrico CTE program. We, we definitely appreciated all the work that they did, the students, and the work that Mac did to help find another car for Miss, for Miss Carter uh, was absolutely great. Now for another two-minute history report. We all know about colleges. There's the state schools, the academic elite, and of course the sports powerhouses. But there's a college that you've heard of that is truly one of a kind, the Electoral College. First of all, it's not really a college. It's a process that we use to determine the President of the United States. Back when our founding fathers were figuring out the rules for this new country, they wanted to make sure that all parts of the country have fair input. So they put into the Constitution that each state would have a group of electors, whose vote would determine the Commander-in-Chief. The number of electors was based on the number of senators and representatives from each state. For example, Wyoming has two senators and one representative, so they have three electors, or electoral votes. California, on the other hand, has 55 electoral votes. The number of state representatives is proportional to state population and is reevaluated every 10 years when new census information is available. Since we have 100 senators, two from each state, 435 representatives or congressmen, we end up with 538 electors. Oops, forgot to mention that the District of Columbia gets three. Half of 538 is 269. So to get the majority of the electoral college, a candidate needs 270 to become president. In most of the country, if you win the popular vote of the state, you get all of their electoral votes. They call it winner take all. The exception is Nebraska and Maine. They use the congressional district method. If you win a region of the state, you get that region's vote. Back in 2008, John McCain got four of Nebraska's electoral votes, while Barack Obama got one. In 2016, Maine gave three votes to Hillary Clinton and one to Donald Trump. That sounds big. Generally, our presidents have won both the Electoral College and the popular vote, but not always. In 1876, Samuel Tilden got 200,000 more votes than Rutherford B. Hayes. A decade later, Grover Cleveland lost his re-election in spite of the fact he had more popular votes. In recent history, Al Gore and Hillary Clinton won the ballot box, but the Electoral College put someone else in the Oval Office. So here it is in a nutshell. The Founding Fathers gave each state a voice on who would be our country's choice. Not equal representation, but votes based on population. The results left some candidates quite dismayed because for this college, 270 is the important grade. That's the Electoral College in two minutes. Starts like this. There once was a king who liked to tell lies. He said it was day. Author and illustrator Alex Beard visited Mayberry Elementary and spoke to a group of second and third graders about his writing process and how he became an author. He said it was dry. Not a cloud in the sky, he says in the pouring rain. He bragged about how high he could fly. Do warthogs fly? No. I am the king, he screamed and he spat. But who could be certain of something like that? He gave out commands to do as I say. But all of his subjects had since turned away. He read his latest book, The Lion King, and shares some of his artistic creativity. Very nice. Okay, you can just sit back down. So these are Niels's hands. Now I know that many of you at Thanksgiving will trace your hand and turn it into a turkey, right? I have a rule, however, and that rule is no turkeys. So let's see what I could turn these guys into. 
And you all tell me when you think you know what it is. Okay, so now we've got JMB's hand up here. And so for the last one of these. Welcome back to the show. Over at Roth Middle School, staff and students are using a school-wide STEAM approach to learning this year. They highlighted all that they've done so far in a night for the community. Well, Rolf's approach to the whole STEAM process was having a school-wide problem. And so in the school, they had the problem of if automation um, occurs and keeps progressing, what life skills are students going to need to be ready for that. We did a project on how automation will affect the workers of Walmart. We did um, cashiers being replaced by kiosks. And so that took different ways with all the different classes. We saw some with robotics, some with nanotechnology, others were about like inventions. How, what are the skills these kids are going to need? So everyone took a creative approach in different ways. Some teachers had focused more with research. Others focused on the process of building or creating. Um, so they had to find the creative way to hook into wow. STEAM, but it was possible. Wow. It just took that extra planning and prep and also discussions amongst the students to get it working so well. So STEAM Night was the culmination of that overall question that they had posed. And so that's why you got to see all the different artifacts and the presentations that the students had put together. You actually got to talk to the students, which was really great because they could put it in their own words, talk with adults, which not all middle schoolers get to normally do. So it was just overall a celebration of what they've done so far and just seeing how they really had jumped in into the deep end starting with STEAM. Yeah, Sphero Candy Cafe, that was done through the sixth grade classes. So every sixth grade student had the opportunity to learn how to do coding with the coordinate plane. And so they were saying that with the restaurant industry, with robotics, eventually your waiters may become robots. But who is gonna code that robot or direct that robot? And so they, the students learned through the Sphero activities how to get to a point. And so your point was now your restaurant customer. Tech classes were focusing with the hydroponic gardening, the vertical gardening, how there's robotics in just farming our food. I know with one of the classes they had brought out the Lego Mindstorm. The students taught themselves how to work the tool because that's the thing is just giving that student the ownership so that they can then teach themselves, teach each other because that's really how you're going to learn it in the sixth grade history classes. They've been studying Jamestown, the settlers, and with that it was how taking water filtration, if the Jamestown settlers had had that, would Jamestown have been the same as it was? Would they have died of you know, dysentery? And so they, in the class they worked on different hypotheses of how they were going to create a filter system. Every student did something a little different. Some were successful, some weren't, but then they had to reflect on that, and that's also part of the learning is from those mistakes. The students are excited when they know that they're doing a STEAM lesson. They perk up, they get excited, and they're engaged. So I'm, we're starting to see those changes. Teachers are starting to take more risks in their teaching, which it is risky. It's not easy. It's not, you know, cut and dry. We know what's going to happen. But that's the way the world is. And so the schools are doing a great job of implementing this. It's getting the excitement. It's tying across the curriculums. And that really is going to help the students in the long run because it connects their learning to things in the real world and to each other. The event was a hit, and we'll look forward to seeing more STEAM-based learning from Roth Middle as we continue on in the school year. Now we'll leave you with a special career fair at Hungry Creek Middle that showcased different ways students could volunteer their time to make their community a better place. 
For School Matters, I'm Sean Gilliland. Thanks for watching. Today we have our Project Heart curriculum being taught, and this is one component of that where we bring in volunteer organizations so that students learn how to give their time, talent, and treasures back to the community. It's one of our ways of meeting the global citizenship six C's in Rico County. Therapeutic groups, uh, people with special needs, or dances, and things like that. They're working with the Project Heart curriculum that talks about um, volunteering, giving back to the community, connecting with other people, sharing your time, talents, and treasures, and um, just being kind to others. I think it gives them a good opportunity to figure out like what organizations there are and how they can help others. We don't pick them up, but we, we contract with a group that picks up the recycling. It tells us places and gives us chances to get our volunteer credits for high school. If every kid knows, um, even if they don't want to do it then, they'll still give them a chance to prepare to volunteer. Volunteerism over the past several years has definitely shifted. Um, it's almost become more of an expectation than a, um, you know something that you would just do uh, if you wanted to. It's a great way to see what you're interested in and this is the time to really understand that you can make decisions that can last or have an impact for the rest of your life. We really want students to um, develop their own passion about volunteering and how to give back to others. Um, rather than just always receiving, but giving back. 